Uh, good morning, everyone, and welcome to the next edition of Prudential series of fund-specific webinars, where today we're going to discuss the Prudential Balance Fund. Uh, the Balance Fund is one of our largest unit trust funds, and we, as Prudential, also manage a significant portion of assets in life-wrapped and segregated mandates for clients that are run to materially the same model. Um, this is the third of these seminars. The, in the first two, where we for both had more than 500 viewers, we covered the Prudential Inflation Plus Fund, firstly, uh, and that specific session uh, took some time to discuss the listed property sector and inflation-linked bonds. And then the second webinar dealt with our income funds and specifically looked at the South African bond market. In today's session, we're going to focus a bit more on asset allocation decisions, as well as the equity market, uh, domestic and global, which make up a large portion of the balanced fund. Uh, with me today to assist me in the session, I have Michael Moyle, who heads up the Prudential Asset Allocation team, and Chris Wood, who is one of the senior equity portfolio managers that are responsible for the management of the equities within the uh, Prudential Balance Fund. Um, thank you to all of those of you who sent through questions beforehand. Uh, we have prepared a few slides that we will be showing and referencing uh, behind the camera uh, to help us through the discussions today. And then please, throughout the session, you are welcome to also submit further questions on our chat line. Uh, we have a team behind the scenes that will collate those questions uh, and sort of group them together in themes, and we're going to try and cover as many of those as we can. Um, finally, uh, for those of you who are phase representatives, uh, today's session will uh, grant you some CBD points. Uh, we will circulate an email tomorrow with a link to the recording of this webinar, as well as your CBD certificate. Okay, um, I think let's kick off, uh, Michael and Chris. Um, Michael, I think if I'm going to start with you, if we just uh, talk a little bit about the recent performance of the Prudential Balance Fund, clearly these have been very uh, challenging conditions in the market. Global economies have really struggled. Uh, the Prudential Balance Fund, as we can see on this chart, has delivered over, and this is a 10-year time frame, some very strong real returns over this period. Uh, and also for most of the period uh, performed in the top quarter of competitive funds. Um, and as we can see though, in the last sort of 12 to 18 months, there has been a pullback in performance um, on a relative and absolute sense, quite sharply into this COVID crisis. Um, Michael, uh, yeah, maybe let's kick off and just talk a bit to us about um, the, the reasons for this performance in, in this recent period. So the question of performance really has, has two parts to the answer. Firstly, it's around the behavior of asset classes or the returns that were on offer to the fund uh, in this period. This chart shows index ret total returns in RAND for, for different asset classes. Um, and you can, we show it for three different periods, um, one year, three years, and five years. And immediately what, what, what jumps out is the disappointing performance of South African growth assets, basically uh, equity and, and property. So you can see over one year, uh, significantly negative performances. Um, and then for equity, basically you're not getting anything uh, per annum over, over three and five years. Um, so clearly the fund is exposed to these assets. Um, we have a significant exposure given the sector we're in. We're in the, the high equity sector. Um, we have an ambitious return target, and we can't get to that target without significant ex exposure to this type, these types of assets. Bonds over the more recent period have also been uh, disappointing, over 12 months. Um, and the fund, given our valuation-based framework, uh, had significant exposure to, to equity and bonds um, in South Africa. So that cost the fund going, going into, the, in, into the crisis. Um, contrast the return on South African assets with those of foreign assets. And one immediately sees that, that, that one got a much higher return from those foreign assets. Of course, the RAND had a big part to play in that. The RAND actually flatters the results of the, of the foreign assets. Um, because we're measuring uh, uh, returns in, in rands. And so in dollar terms, the, the assets still had reasonable returns, but not, not as great. Um, so that's, that's really the one part around the, 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 uh, what the beta or the market returns. Uh, 
Um, we also had uh, some underperformance from security selection within the last those 12 months. Maybe Chris can, can elaborate on that a little yeah, bit. Thanks, thanks Michael. Um, as, as you highlight, you know, the, the, the largest exposure in the portfolio, the SA equity, has delivered uh, poor absolute returns over the five years. But what did certainly contribute to the bigger drawdown relative to the, the peer group uh, was a period of poor stock picking, um, some of which we will discuss, but you know, there were specific uh, holdings within the portfolio that have detracted. Thank you. Michael, we, um, we did get a question on also th these absolute returns, of course, but also our peer relative performance to our leading competitors. Uh, the uh, FECA rules preclude us from naming those competitor funds, but can you just talk a little bit about how the fund has actually performed in relation to the sort of cohort of funds against which we would compare our performance? Yes, Bernard, we've, the, we've got a chart here that shows the dispersion of returns uh, for our fund along with the six other largest funds in the sector. So we show the fund here, um, we show the, the minimum return, the maximum return is the top of the, uh, the bar, and then it's divided into quartiles. Um, we, we, we show the, the, the top seven funds, including us, which is really around looking at funds that are similar size, and sorry, top, by top seven, I mean the, the, the seven largest funds. Um, we haven't chosen them because they're an easier comparator for us. Uh, on the contrary, these funds uh, have generally outperformed the median fund over time. So what we're looking at here is um, the range of returns, the median return, and you can see that uh, our median is at the median of, of our competitor funds or higher. Um, the other feature that I'd like to point out is our dispersion uh, or the differences between the extremes is in line with, with the other funds. So in general, our performance has been as good or better and, and, and the risk has been very similar over this period. Now the period I'm talking about, we're measuring uh, five-year returns over the last 10 years. Then, then the, uh, the other point I want to make concerns the fund's uh, recent performance. So the, the, the dot on, these char on this chart shows how the fund has done over the most recent five-year period compared to that, the, the, those historical numbers. And you'll observe that across the board with the exception of one of the funds, that most recent return is in the fourth quartile. So what does that say? Well, generally funds have struggled in the recent period against, against their own history. Michael, thank you. That, you know, that recent period, I think, if we can just explore that a bit more. So the, this COVID crisis has been the worst sort of crisis that the Prudential Balance Fund has seen in its 25 plus year history. Um, as we can observe on, on this chart, the fund is down from peak by about 30% into the crisis, uh, that's late March, um, versus, for example, the minus 16% contraction that we saw in the global financial crisis. Um, remarkably, it has subsequently returned 33%, so an extraordinarily strong and sharp recovery, a rebound in performance. It's not quite back to the levels that it started off from, but, but certainly has covered a lot of that, or recovered a lot of that ground. Um, I mean, this, this implies some very interesting asset allocation positions in the fund and, and potentially some changes that the portfolio has seen at an asset allocation level. So can we take a few minutes just to unpack how the team thinks about asset allocation and what were sort of the main changes made to the portfolio in this, in this crisis period? Yes. Um, well, as you say, very gratifying to, have, to, to, to observe the recovery, but, but still further to go. Um, there, there are a few features here. So what, what we're showing is asset allocation now, which is the red bars, versus six months ago at the end of last year. So, you know, obviously two, two parts of inf information you can take from this is, is how are we exposed currently, which affect, will affect the fund's performance going forward, as well as what changes have we made. So the, the first point I'd m want to make is that we're significantly opposed to, uh, exposed to equity uh, both local and foreign. Um, this fund sits in the high equity sector. We're targeting uh, ambitious returns 
and so we would need exposure to, to those growth assets. Um, what changes have we made? Well, we've, we've reduced some of our foreign equity. Um, the, global, the global recovery has been faster, certainly in, in, in the US and some developed markets, uh, faster than in South Africa. So we've, we've reduced some of the, the global equity and increased our exposure to, to South African nominal bonds, mostly in the longer dated area, where we've seen uh, uh, significant weakness during the crisis. And so we've, uh, we, we've bought into that weakness in line with our valuation-based based approach. Um, the, the, the other point to, to, to note is that uh, we started off the year with uh, a low exposure to property, and we've reduced that uh, some, somewhat further uh, over the six months as, as the risks to that sector have become more and more apparent. Um, we, we build those positions based on our assessment of valuations. Uh, this slide shows our framework for looking at asset class valuations. So what we're looking at here are real returns to different asset classes, both domestic and global. The dots show what we think these asset classes should deliver over time as compensation for taking on the risk of, of, of being exposed to those assets. Um, it's, 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 I don't think it's controversial or surprising that it's upward sloping from left to right. As we take on more and more risk, there's more volatility, there's more uncertainty about cash flows. So uh, one would expect to be compensated with a higher real return. Um, the, the second part of this chart shows the current prospective returns or real yields. We based it on, on, on valuations, so we don't have a complicated econometric model. We have a, a very simple way of thinking about it. Uh, really, the complexity comes into digging deeper into the asset classes uh, subsequent to, to thinking about the overall valuation. And so here, uh, I'll use the, the South African government bonds as an example. What we do is we look at the yield, in this case, the yield to maturity. Now, we don't hold, it, hold these assets to maturity, but it provides a useful steer as to, as, as to valuation and the expected returns over a, a shorter period than 10 years, uh, possibly. So we look at the yield to maturity, we strip out expected inflation, and we end up with, with, with a real return or a ye real yield. Um, so in this case, one would expect to earn somewhere around 4.5% real, uh, which would be a better return than the gray dot, a higher number than the gray dot. And so one would say we, we would see that asset class as being cheap or attractive. And so we'd want to be overweight that asset class. So there are a few features. Um, the one is that the, the South African assets generally offer better value than global assets. In particular, if we look at equity, you can see how the red bar for, for equity is above the dot, uh, implying cheapness, whereas in global equity, uh, it's, it's slightly below fair. So we saw the recovery in global equity is much more rapid, as well as a reduction in expected earnings due to, to, to some impairment from the, from the crisis. Um, another feature is if we look at South African bonds versus cash, we can see a significant pickup, and I'll speak some more about that, that, that later. So we've got a, co a combination of, 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 um, of, of different relative attractiveness. Uh, cash, a few months ago, you know, starting the year, was, was yielding significantly better. We've had interest rate cuts, and so now you're not even being compensated for inflation by when, when, you, when you hold those, those assets. Then uh, as a final point, I'd just like to mention, you know, property on the face of it looks like this fantastic investment. Who wouldn't want 10% real from, from an asset class? Our concern really is that that forward yield number, which is based on consensus forecasts, uh, we think is, is risky. There's, there's a lot of risk to that sector.
uh, given the environment we're finding ourselves in. So that's one where we're actually going against that signal and we're saying we'd rather own less property. Okay. Michael, before we turn to equity and, and also introduce Chris into the discussion, just going back to the fixed income allocation. So that has risen from around 17 to 21 percent. Uh, clearly the yields are there, but it, it is in, uh, sort of a, uh, appears to be quite a risky trade considering the perilous state of the country's fiscal position. Can you talk a little bit more about that decision to increase SA government bonds? Yes, uh, certainly. We, you know, we, we think about risk and return, of course. And so there's, the, the, there's no arguing that uh, this, the, these instruments are riskier than they, they were. The environment is, 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 is riskier. The government finances are in a worse state. They potentially um, have, 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 have much bigger problems given the, the, the uh, decrease in revenue and increase in expenditure during this, this crisis. Um, and of course, the government finances weren't in, great, uh, in a great state going into the crisis, given the, the uh, problems with slow growth and, and the SOEs, just to, to name two. Um, nevertheless, we, we, we've, we have to think about what reward we're getting. And so when we think of bonds, we're thinking of the yield, as well as the potential for a re-rating, a capital gain. So in this chart, we're showing the, the yield to maturity of the 20-year government bond. And we're looking at uh, what sort of compensation you can get, what you can earn on that, um, versus cash. So we're contrasting it with a cash, cash yield. And these are annualized or annual rates. So at the beginning of the year, bonds, you could get 3%, about or slightly more than 3% more than cash per annum for earning bonds instead of cash, which we thought was, was pretty attractive. Of course, in the crisis, these yields have moved out. Uh, the bond yields, that is, they've, they've increased rapidly. They have recovered slightly, but, but not much. And so currently, you're getting over 7% per annum more if you buy bonds instead of cash. We think this is a legitimate signal a very strong signal, and so we believe we're being compensated, in fact, overcompensated for the risks. Okay, thank you. Um, yeah, just before we turn uh, into the equity section, just at an asset allocation level, equities make up, as one would expect, the largest portion of the balance fund. It's about two-thirds of total assets, local and global. Um, can we just d dig into that valuation a little bit more, the decision to be overweight equities, which into the crisis obviously you know, hurt the fund's performance? Um, uh, how have the team thought about that um, and the decisions taken in the crisis itself? Right. So, the, so with, with equity, there are a variety of valuation metrics that one can can look at. Um, we, we at the moment we are looking at price to book. Um, we we can see the the history against um, of 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 glo both global and South African equity. Um, and you know, a few years ago, we were trading in South Africa on a very similar price to book uh, level to, to global equity. Um, subsequent to that, global equity has actually re-rated and South African equity has de-rated over time as the various fundamental problems within South Africa have, have manifested themselves. Um, so we're at a point now with a, a current price to book value of 1.4 times in South Africa against our average, long run average of about 2.2 times, where we think there's, there's, there's a, a significant signal. It's, it, we think there's very good value within, within that uh, equity, South African equity, as an asset class. Now we leave it to Chris and his team to choose individual stocks and individual sectors within equity. Um, we're looking at the, the, to the total market, the total equity. So we're at a point now where if you look back over, the, over history, um, we, we're seldom this cheap. And uh, why do we think that's, that, that's important? Well, we can look at what, when you, if you were to have bought equity at these kinds of levels, what was your subsequent return? So this chart shows a study that we've put together over a number of years looking at the price to book value of our market and then what happened over the next five years. What was your annualized five-year total return after that? And 
um, we're not surprised, in fact it, it, it goes hand in hand with our valuation based approach to expect that this broadly the trend is downward sloping from left to right. So what that says is uh, as the price to book gets higher and higher, so one can reasonably expect a lower and lower subsequent return. Um, if, if, if we look at another feature of this chart, we put a red line there and that is goes through the 1.4 point on the x-axis. So that shows where we are currently in terms of the valuation. The length of the line is also significant in that the line shows you what the least and the highest return that our market has delivered over the period in terms of five-year ret annualized returns. So any point in history, it's, you could think of it if, if you say that there isn't really a, uh, a reason why we're going to be completely different into the future, well, you can think of it as a range of expected returns. And then um, the, the, given that that covers the entire range, the point I want to make is, well, at this price to book, what's your range? And it's significantly improved. It doesn't go negative. It's from round about 16, 17 percent to about 45 percent that you could, could reasonably expect. Now, obviously, it's a huge range, but I think the key takeaway here is, you know, given especially what we've been experiencing over the last five years, 16 percent per annum over five years is a great return. Okay, thanks, Michael. Um, yeah, this is a good point to turn to Chris, perhaps, and talk a bit about the South African equities in the fund. As I said, it is the largest portion of, of the assets. So, Chris, this crisis has, has been quite extraordinary in terms of the extent of stock and sector level movements in share prices. Um, clearly, we were on the wrong side of some of those trades. Uh, for example, the overweight Sasol position that detracted from performance. But can you just talk a little bit about the movements that the, the team has seen and some of the decisions that you've taken within the, the equity section of the portfolio? Yes, thanks, thanks Bernard. Um, yeah, I, I, I think I should just take the, uh, take the opportunity to just acknowledge that you know, the last 12 months has been a period of um, some poor stock picking. Um, and as you allude, you know, our position in Sasol um, has, has, hurt, has hurt performance, but it, it's not the only, the only detractor. Um, so before I talk about some of the position or current positioning and changes that have been made, uh, just to give some context, what we're showing here is the price performance uh, year to date uh, of a variety of sectors and individual stocks. Um, Sasol stands out as, as the black line at the bottom in that uh, despite a recovery from its March low, um, the, the stock is still you know, more than 50% below where it started the year. Uh, this was a company to which we were overweight. Um, in contrast, uh, the gold sector, this is not the gold price, this represents the, the JSC listed gold sector. Um, in, in gold, at the top of the chart, has returned uh, you know, almost 90% over this same period. Um, and you know, this, this was a sector to which we were underweight and we'll address that in a bit more detail a bit later. Um, the other key takeaways from the chart are you know, below gold we've shown both Process and Naspes. Um, as admittedly these two companies derive most of their uh, value from their investment in Tencent listed in Hong Kong. Um, but they have very little to do, if anything, with South Africa and the, the, you know, the South African economy. And so they, they have benefited from being, you know, uh, deriving value from a set of offshore earnings um, and benefiting from a weaker rand. And that, that holds true, but to, you know, not, you know, hasn't delivered quite the same performance, but British American Tobacco has still beaten uh, the index, which is shown in the red line uh, running through the middle of the series. Um, British American Tobacco um, likewise doesn't generate um, much uh, of its profit from South Africa. Um, it, is a, it is a more you know, traditional defensive name. And so even though it pulled, da pulled back in the March sell-off, it, it had a more you know, shallow uh, price decline. Um, and then the last point to highlight is, is sort of the other uh, domestic focused uh, sectors, um, the banks, the general retailers, and food and drug retailers. Um, the food and drug retailers in, in, the, in the pink color um, uh, have um, 
you know, are, were unaffected by lockdown and therefore continue to trade. And as a result, we've seen, a, you know, they, they have outperformed um, the, you know, uh, the general retailers, the apparel retailers that uh, suffered an extended period in which they were, were unable to trade um, and um, as a result of lockdown. And similarly, the, the, you know, the banks, uh, which are, you know, a sub, you know, almost solely dependent on, on the domestic economy uh, from which they derive uh, profits. If one now moves to the, how we're positioned, uh, those, you know, uh, those of you should be uh, quite familiar with this chart. We're, we're showing in red the current uh, sector positions um, of the, the equity uh, slice of the balance fund. Uh, how it is currently uh, positioned uh, versus where it was in June of last year. Um, and so uh, our approach is always to try and not take significant or sort of overlay a top-down uh, sectoral view. We, we try to build a portfolio that is uh, uh, giving broad exposure across a range of sectors and we pick stocks within sectors. Uh, so again, what, what, what I should highlight is in that non-mining, it's a combination of our position in Sassel and Sappy, a paper company uh, that contributed to what was an overweight position a year ago that you know, has shrunk to, 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 um, to being more neutral. Um, and unfortunately, in this case, this is not us having reduced exposure by way of you know, having sold um, our, our exposure, uh, but rather the price fall has meant that th those stocks have underperformed and in effect, that, that has contributed to the negative alpha. Um, on the far right-hand side, we just show uh, the financials. Um, and, and this is a, you know, uh, a situation where we've actually added uh, to our exposure uh, to, to the banks, uh, given their relative price moves and the valuation signal that we will discuss a bit later. And then lastly, within the industrial segments, uh, sectors of the portfolio, uh, just to draw attention to consumer services, in which there's a number of changes that have found their way into the portfolio. Uh, but we took advantage of the relative price moves between the food and drug retail and general retail um, by selling pick and pay um, out of the portfolio and buying a combination of Trueworths and Trueworths, sorry, Trueworths and the Fushini Group. Um, and, and again, it's, it's our belief that we, we've just seen such dramatic relative price moves that we're prepared to uh, act on some of the valuation signals uh, despite all the negative no noise and, and the, uh, the, the, the relative performances. Chris, uh, yeah, just we had a few questions from clients on the consumer services sector. Uh, those businesses obviously facing off a consumer that's under significant strain. Can you just talk a little bit about potentially uh, you know, some of the position changes or stock changes that have taken place there? Yes, thanks, thanks Bernard. Um, one example, and, and this was covered in a previous webinar on the equity, uh, the equity fund, but one of the, the single largest uh, um, changes or, or additions um, in terms of a stock idea was, was a company called Bidcorp. Um, this company for us exhibits a number of uh, characteristics that would uh, qualify it as a high quality business. Um, so just to explain the chart, what we're showing in the red stepped line is on the right-hand axis is a measure of profitability or the EBITDA of Bitcorp. Um, and then on the left-hand axis, um, we are showing both the debt um, and the market capitalization. So the, com the market cap plus the debt making up the enterprise value of Bitcorp. Uh, what is uh, you know, noteworthy is the relatively low level of uh, gearing or, or debt indebtedness of Bitcorp, making it, you know, uh, it has a very strong balance sheet, one that we think is uh, well placed to uh, withstand this uh, crisis. And then the other um, observable uh, noteworthy features is, is that red line has enjoyed a, you know, um, a 15 year sort of history of having uninterrupted growth, uh, compounding of profits um, and such that it makes, you know, it's a high return business. This was a company that we were uh, largely, we were underweight uh, prior to March. Um, and so there's a rather precipitous fall that one can observe in the gray, uh, the green shaded um, uh, area of the market cap. Um, I should note that we've scaled the chart such that uh, the, the 
the EBITDA is on 12 and a half times. Uh, so that's a multiple that we think is fair for, for Bidcorp. And when that green shaded area is above the red uh, step line, it suggests that it's trading on a multiple higher than 12 and a half. But in the crisis in March, the, the drawdown meant that one was able to uh, buy exposure to Bidcorp on um, a multiple of less than 10 times historic uh, profits. What one can observe is that in the forecast, um, the last period, uh, there has been a sort of a downgrading of expectations um, as a result of uh, the virus. Uh, but we are pleased to observe that relative to our purchasing um, at around 200 Rand a share, we've seen an almost 40% recovery in the price of Bidcorp. Um, and, you know, it's this, uh, what, what the, the key takeaway I'd, I'd like to leave you with is that in a crisis, one often gets the opportunity to buy great businesses at a, at a good price. Okay. Talking about great businesses and perhaps not so great businesses, Chris, the one position that has um, detracted in recent performance, but it's not one that the team has materially changed their view on, is the gold sector. Um, and we've obviously had a few questions from clients on, on gold, I guess both the metal, the bullion and gold companies. So how does the team think through that sector of, of our economy and, and, and the stock market? Okay, thanks Bernard. Uh, before talking to the gold sector, and as, as we've already shown, it's, it's, been a, uh, it's delivered some strong returns this year. Uh, just to try and talk to the gold price itself, um, it's a very difficult um, asset to, to uh, have any sort of sense of value or valuation anchor. What we're highlighting in this particular chart is the gold price in dollars in the red on the left-hand axis. Um, and I've plotted it against uh, the US real yields as measured by the 10-year tips. Um, and just to note, that's on the right-hand axis, but it's been inverted. Um, so the, the, as that black line is rising, uh, what, we're, what we're actually showing is that the yields are, are going more negative um, where they are today. Um, so these are both safe haven assets in times of crisis. Um, investors uh, gravitate towards uh, owning gold as a perceived store of value, or your alternative is to you know, buy the, 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 the uh, inflation-linked uh, US bonds. Um, but it's a, it's a rather confounding world in which we find ourselves today in which investors are actually willing to pay uh, the US uh, government, and it's not unique to the US, we, we observe this in other developed markets, but are paying to, uh, you know, for the certainty of uh, making a known, albeit small loss, over the period of ownership of that bond. And during these periods where money um, effectively is uh, costing you very little, owning a, no, a, a non-yielding metal like gold, you know, we can observe this relationship uh, lastly, you know, the, 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 the point at which we're at today is, is not dissimilar to where we were back at the previous peak in gold in 2012-2013. Um, and, you know, we, we, I don't have a crystal ball. I, I don't, you know, it's not to say that gold can't go higher, um, but in order for that uh, to materialize, it would appear that one would, would need bond yields to go more negative. Um, Moving on to the gold sector, or the, 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 the South African uh, stocks into which we could potentially invest, uh, this chart, again, the red line represents the dollar gold price on the right-hand axis. So the prevailing spot price today is around $1,800. Um, and then on the left-hand axis, we've, we've sort of uh, got a graphical representation of the, the cash flow statement of, of the gold sectors. So it's an aggregate of all of the listed gold companies um, uh, on the pot, uh, you know, in the pot, uh, in the orange, uh, the gold color uh, above the line is the profitability, um, the cash flow that they generate uh, from operations. Um, and we can see that there's a clear relationship in periods of high gold price, uh, gold companies make more profit. Um, so similar to the previous peak in 2012, uh, 2011 through to 2013, uh, we saw uh, elevated level of profitability, and that is projected uh, to repeat in, in, in the coming financial year. Um, uh, but also on the, in the gray bars, we, we, we can observe that in times, in, in good times, uh, gold, South African gold companies need to spend more. So they invest uh, capex um, in order to extend what are otherwise very short reserve life. 
Um, the net is that what one receives as an investor as represented by the black circles, uh, the dividends that come t back to you or return to you uh, for investing in these gold companies is, is very limited. And so the, gold, the dividends that are projected to be, you know, or that one received this current, in this past financial year, you know, are below that that we received almost 20 years ago. Um, and so for us, it's the, the lack of free cash flow generation um, from the gold sector that uh, leaves us uh, choosing to put our money uh, into alternative um, SA stocks that are, you know, in, in our view, better cash generators, um, and, and hence we maintain a, an underweight uh, position to, to the South African gold companies. Chris, thanks. Um, let's just turn lastly to the financial sector, particularly the fund position in banks. Um, it's a uh, position we held, but we've also added to in the crisis. Just talk us through that a little bit. Um, certainly, uh, sort of to the, from the perspective of the extent to which bank share prices are discounting sufficiently the potential for rising bad debts. Okay, thanks, thanks Bernard. Um, the, the largest bank exposure within the portfolio is Standard Bank. Um, and you know what, we, we do acknowledge that there will be um, some challenges uh, as a result of uh, the, the lockdown uh, the, and, and the pressure on the consumer. There'll be bad debts both from uh, private individuals as well as uh, uh, corporates. Uh, but what we can observe here is a 30-year history of Standard Bank's uh, dividend yields um, or, or dividends delivered. Uh, in, in black, we've placed that stream of dividends on a 3% yield, and in gold, uh, I've used 6%. Um, uh, you know, when we overlay the share price, um, I can explain, you know, one can see that Standard Bank has traded within this range of dividend yield. So when the red line, the share price, was, uh, is touching that black line, it means that investors are willing to accept a 3% yield. Um, and when it's on the gold line, uh, they're, they're demanding a 6% yield. But if one looks to the most recent uh, data point on, you know, the share has lost, you know, at, at a point in May, Standard Bank had fallen um, over 50% from where it started the year. Um, and as the heading says, you know, in our view, this, this is more than just a suspension of dividends that may arise uh, because of um, challenges or bad debts and, and the need to raise additional provisioning. Um, the, 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 the yield on offer from Standard Bank is, you know, was, was over 8.5%. Um, and one, uh, one is being given this unique opportunity to buy exposure to Standard Bank uh, cheaper than you've, you've ever had in, in the last 30 years. So we don't disagree that there may be some uh, you know, short-term pressure on the, on the dividend yield, uh, but we believe that the valuation or the risk uh, that, that we're willing to bear that risk um, of the dividends being suspended and, and potentially cut on the expectation that in a point in the future, um, Standard Bank's uh, profitability can recover to a level that it was uh, in 2019. Uh, what gives us that comfort is that, you know, all of the South African banks are far better provided in terms of capital adequacy um, currently uh, versus, prior, you know, versus the, where they were in the, in the global financial crisis. Um, so effectively, in answer to the question, it's, it's the valuation uh, that we think gives us odds you know, in our favor to accommodate the, the, the short-term noise and, and the headwinds to, to current dividends. Thanks, Chris. Uh, yeah, I guess the, the topic of interest rate sensitive assets, maybe, Michael, if I can bring you back into the into the debate. Um, let's just turn to the currency briefly. Uh, the exchange rate, obviously, a very different, difficult asset to have a, a strong view on. Um, but how does the team think about its exposure to non-RAND assets? Uh, in the crisis, you, as you mentioned earlier, you did take some profit and, and brought some assets um, back into, into RANDs. Uh, and then perhaps sort of a, a second question, if I may uh, link to that. Uh, uh, from our clients, a few have asked this, in a world without Regulation 28 limits and without exchange controls, uh, what would be our preferred sort of normal offshore exposure within in the balance fund? Yeah, thanks, Bernard. Um, I'd like to reverse those questions, if I may, answer the, the second one first. Um, we think that, that an average or neutral or strategic position 
um, sh on the on the foreign assets should be somewhere around 25 to 35 percent of your fund. Um, it's 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 not an exact thing. I think you can think about it in in a variety of ways. Um, we one one way to think about it is um, we've got South African assets where you're earning what we think would be a, a higher return than in global assets because um, you earn a risk premium as compensation for the risk of, of investing in a single country, namely South Africa, um, versus the diversification benefits that you can get from, from investing offshore, both through, through uh, having a broader range of investments as well as through the currency, which is, which is key. Um, so you, you know, we, you, you're weighing up the risk versus the return and, you, and, and we end up some, somewhere in, in that sort of 25 to 35% range. Um, you know, there are a few other considerations. You know, if we're saving in South Africa, you're saving to protect your, your South African rand purchasing power. So, you know, we, we think it's difficult to, to say, you know, you would need 100% offshore because that's maybe safest or something like that. Um, but 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 we think that, that that's broadly the range where we would be on a on an on an average level. Of course, tactically, um, being active managers, we move around. So we would uh, would 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 either overweight or underweight. Or, you know, take money money offshore or, or, or repatriate it. Which I guess brings me to to the other question. Um, so. In, in the crisis, we saw the, 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 the well, I guess in the build-up to the crisis, well, we've seen the RAND weaken quite a bit. Um, so, you know, when, we, when we're thinking about South Africa, we, we, we always have to think about um, sort of broadly two aspects. The one is, well, you know, we think about South Africa-related fundamentals. Um, we can think of um, for example, the, the, the problem with ESCOM's uh, generating capability and its, its balance sheet. Um, you can think of government finances. And then we also need to think about uh, what are emerging markets doing? Because emerging markets also, um, you know, we are an emerging market and we move around with, with other emerging markets. So it's really a, 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 a combination of, of, of factors uh, caused the RAND to weaken rapidly uh, into April this year. Obviously, the COVID uh, crisis has ha had a lot to do with the timing. And at 19 RAND to the dollar, we saw uh, an opportunity to, to reduce exposure to hard currencies, to dollars, and to increase exposure to the RAND. So what we did was we sold some, some foreign assets um, bear in mind that in April the recovery in, 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 in certain developed market stock markets was, was well underway and so we were uh, reducing exposure to assets that were not at their lows uh, and we bought South African government bonds. So that was an opportunity to, to, to both reverse the currency trade, to, to take money, bring money back from dollars and to invest in a high yielding uh, asset that we th thought had significant potential. So, Michael, once the decision to externalize money has been taken, in those offshore markets, where at the moment are you seeing opportunities? How's the fund being deployed in, in terms of the offshore component? Um, we, you know, as, as, as uh, our audience will have seen from the, the, the slide a while back on asset allocation, we still have significant exposure to, to global equity. Um, we, uh, with, with, within the global equity, we have uh, uh, an underweight position to to uh, United States, to to uh, the S and P 500, to American stock markets, um, and that's really around the the fact that 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 market has recovered the fastest. The valuation gap between it and basically the rest of the world has opened up. So uh, even prior to the crisis, uh, we were. Uh, underweight the U.S., given that that uh, the, its its valuation looked looked expensive on a relative basis to the rest of the world. So within the rest of the world, we seek to to gain exposure to to the better value markets, uh, which are really a combination of developed and emerging markets. Um, 
in the, within the, the fixed income part of the portfolio, um, the, the, the major change there is we've introduced exposure to uh, the 30-year US Treasury bond. And that's really a diversification or, or insurance asset. So uh, it has a very low correlation with, with, with US uh, stock markets. And so uh, when, when, if we were to, to, to have a, a hiccup or a, a, a disappointment, you know, we've seen a very quick, quick recovery in stock markets, so potentially there, there, there's risk of a, of a hiccup. Um, this, this asset tends to move in the opposite direction. So we're getting some yield. Um, it's about one and a quarter percent, one point three percent, something like that. But that's not really the reason for owning it. It's it's, it's about its diversification benefit. Should should the recovery falter? Right. Thank you, Chris and, and Michael, for your time. Um, before we move to sort of live questions that have come in through the session, um, I, I guess clients have asked us what to expect going forward. Uh, the conditions currently are, of course, very trying. But as an investor in the Prudential Balance Fund, what should our expectations be for this fund over the sort of medium term from here? Okay, Bernard, if I can just kick off with, you know, I'd like to leave the audience with three key points um, that hopefully we, we've addressed in the course of the presentation. But, you know, often we hear this uh, statement that, the, you know, the future is uncertain. Um, I would just like to remind everyone that it's always uncertain and that there are always going to be unknowns. Um, I don't know when earnings uh, for the companies discussed today you know, revert back to levels seen last year. Uh, but on the second point, what I hope we've demonstrated is that you know, the SA market uh, valuations today, in our opinion, are, are discounting a lot of bad news and, and, and that it's that willingness uh, to back the valuation signal um, and, and the odds of uh, you know, these, these more attractive returns uh, on a prospective basis. Um, and then just lastly, and I think it was illustrated in the, the discussion around Bidcorp, um, crises in our view, you know, and it, it, it applies to other asset classes too, but they present opportunities. Um, and it's, it's, you know, it's this opportunity to buy good companies at, at great prices uh, that gives us conf confidence um, on our ability to deliver better returns to the investors um, over the next five years. Thanks. And uh, to add to what uh, Chris said, I've got a, a couple of points. I'm um, really, uh, firstly, I'd like to say, you know, these these crises such as what we've just been through, and you know, it's not over yet. But um, certainly, the asset price we have hit a trough and a recovery. Um, these crises test us, and you know, I think we we followed our process uh, through the through the crisis. We were uh, all the way down as asset prices were falling. We were evaluating prospects and, and making decisions about increasing or decreasing exposure. Um, we, we, we made certain decisions. I think that's reflected in the, the recovery in the slide you showed towards the beginning of this, this webinar. So, you know, we, we, we followed our process. We've uh, invested in, 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 in those assets where we thought the risk would be rewarded. And, um, reduced exposure to those assets that where we thought we were not getting rewarded for, for the risk or the risks had gone up. Um, and, then, and then really my, my uh, final point is around prospects for the fund. You know, we th I think we've, we've certainly shown in our view that, that there are attractively valued assets that we can buy at an asset class level as well as within the, the stock market that, that Chris spoke about. Um, we, 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 we're, we think we're, we've positioned the fund correctly given our assessment of those opportunities. Um, people always want to hear a number, what, what sort of return can we expect? Um, of course, it comes with a huge health warning that, that these, uh, the, the fund is volatile, it's invested in volatile assets, so um, it, it, it can be a bumpy ride. But over time, you know, with a reason, reasonable time frame, one could expect sort of low double digit returns. Um, to the fund, sort of the 10 in the 10 to 14 range, something like that per annum, um, which would translate, depending on what happens with inflation, to six or seven or e percent or even higher uh, uh, real return for the for the fund. So definitely, 
um, one would expect a lot better than the recent period and, and uh, a reasonable return. Great, thank you. So, so as you say on the slide, time to be cautious but not timid. Um, so that brings us to the end of the pre-submitted questions. Um, as we spoke, a few further questions came through on the chat line. Um, so we're going to take a few minutes to see how many of those we can respond to. They have been broadly collated into sort of themes, so um, we'll paraphrase some of the specific questions. Um, and let's take the last few minutes of the session and just see how many we can get through. Yeah, so the first question on the live chat line that we received uh, from Andre concerns prescribed assets um, and what Brinsel's views on, on this is. I'm, I'm happy to actually take this one. Um, so firstly, I should say that as a firm across our client portfolios, we, we do invest significant amounts into mainly SA government bonds, some 38 billion rands of exposure that we hold, and about 8 billion rand into municipal and state-owned enterprise companies. And, and those, of course, all have a a form of developmental objective. Um, so it's not for us a question of not being willing to deploy savings, uh, the savings pool into these opportunities, but it is much more a concern around the absence, I guess, of well-executed bankable investment opportunities that, that we need. Um, we would be opposed to prescribed assets uh, for obvious reasons. It's been tried before. Uh, they, it tends to distort price discovery in markets. It imposes limitations on the flexibility of, of investors and pension funds. And of course, also, since it was previously done uh, to today, um, the savings market has moved. We now have much more defined contribution funds where individual members move between funds and require daily liquidity in their portfolios. Uh, and the typical type of prescribed investment opportunity um, is not valued daily and that does not provide um, sort of daily value um, liquidity opportunities. Um, so we are as a firm across a number of our colleagues working through the CISA bodies that are engaging with government to find mechanisms through which we can structure, as I mentioned, more um, effective bankable investment opportunities that can be developmental in nature. Uh, so thank you for that question to Andre. Um, then a second question from Clem, uh, and this concerns the graph that Michael showed on the evaluation across asset classes and specifically the observed uh, consensus yield on property being quite high relative to its sort of fair value anchor um, versus our relatively low exposure in the fund of around 2% to the property market. Uh, so Michael, I, there were some questions around just marrying that what seems to be a very cheap asset versus an underweight um, allocation. And I guess by its nature, also the concerns around the property sector. So can we maybe just repeat some of those points and touch on them in a bit more detail? And Chris, on a, at a stock level, perhaps. Sure, Bernard. Um, so so it's, it's correct, the forward, it's the forward distribution yield, which is based on, on a forward distribution number uh, one year out. Um, which is, is, is an assumption or a forecast from, from a consensus, from a, a group of analysts. Um, it's a ratio, so it's, of course it's, it's that forward distribution divided by price. And so we, what we observed is that as, as um, in fact this is something that's been going on the last couple of years, but certainly uh, with the crisis as well, as, as price fell, um, earnings or future earnings were being downgraded but price was falling faster. And so what you got was that yield or future return going, going up. So our concern really is, is, is around the fact that those, those consensus earnings have not been falling fast enough. Uh, in, 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 in comparable global investments, we've observed a, a much quicker uh, reduction in, 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 in those, those forecasts. So it's, it's on the face of it, at, at total sector level, um, on those numbers, it looks attractive, but we're concerned about those risks to, to those future earnings. Um, within, within our portfolio, we've got different stocks, and Chris can, can talk a bit more about that. Yeah, thanks, Michael. Um, so from a stock picking select, uh, perspective within the property, um, our property team have uh, chosen to favor um, offshore rather than uh, SA-focused uh, REITs. Um, this, you know, in, it is in part because we, you know, so the, the largest overweight is, is resilient as well as Netty Rock Castle. 
Uh, NEPI is predominantly uh, Eastern European focused uh, in Poland, Romania. Um, one of the reasons our property team likes uh, these two names is, is that they, they are less, less leveraged than some of the, the South African counterparts. But we are also seeing early, you know, a, a faster recovery or return to normality uh, post, post the crisis. And so uh, NEPI shopping malls um, are reporting that come the end of this month, they're, they're seeing a footfall that's almost back to 95% of the level uh, pre-crisis. Uh, in addition, a couple of other examples are to look outside of sort of traditional office and, and retail exposure. Um, and we have uh, holdings in, in equ equities, property fund, as well as um, uh, uh, storage. So these are, these, are these are property companies that have exposure to logistics, uh, logistic uh, warehouses, as well as um, self storage units and and therefore you know we, we favor those where we can un we believe there's underlying organic growth um, that gives us comfort that the distributions that Michael refers to uh, can arrive and, and won't be permanently impaired Thanks. thank you uh, then a question from Giovanni um, this is an um, issue that has actually received a bit of airtime in the press in the last few weeks again a number of South African companies have tried to diversify their businesses into global markets, uh, very often with, let's call it, less than successful outcomes for investors. What is the equities, equity team's view on management companies, management teams of these companies and how they externalize capital? Thanks, Thanks Bernard. Thanks for the question. Um, it is indeed the case that there's, any, there's a host of examples of companies, South African companies that believe uh, you know, for a variety of reasons that have take, you know, taken the decision to make acquisitions offshore and, and there are more um, disappointments than there are successes. Uh, one of the key motivations has often been that this is a market, uh, South African economy that is uh, offering low growth or you know, perhaps their domestic business is mature um, and, and enjoys a dominant market share um, and hence they go and seek growth um, uh, offshore we remain quite skeptical about this acquisitive uh, growth strategy um, and also skeptical about what value add can, you know, can, can these management teams bring to, um, you know, mature, other mature markets in, in, you know, in the likes of the UK or Australia. Um, and, and so for us, you know, there, there is, uh, you know, a, a, an analysis of the capital allocation and, and what we have seen his, you know, in history is that often these, these deals are done at, at exactly the wrong point in the cycle. It's either at the point when the RAND is, is, is really weak and therefore you're seeking to diversify your earnings base, or it's a case of just overpaying for, for a prospect of growth that doesn't actually materialize. Thank you. Um, I think we're sort of getting to the end of the session. Uh, there's time for one more question, and, and this is perhaps one that the two of you can share. Um, so a few clients have asked that it would appear that our portfolio is positioned with a relatively bullish view, I guess, on the um, prospects for this African economic recovery um, against the face of very challenging conditions outside. Um, how do we reconcile the positioning, I guess, both at an asset allocation perspective as well as perhaps into SA equities versus these economic headwinds that we're facing? I don't know, maybe Michael can yeah. keep off. Sure. Um, so, you know, the, we've, we've observed slow economic growth over a number of years. Um, and of course, more recently, we're in the self-induced uh, slowdown or, or decline in economic activity um, as, as we've locked down to try and counteract the, the health effect of, of or the negative health effect of, of the COVID virus. So, you know, undoubtedly, we all know this has had a profound impact on, on life and, and businesses in, in South Africa. So you know, what, when will we recover and how much will we recover and all of that, we don't know. I don't think anyone can say with, with any degree of certainty how this plays out going forward. Um, we can observe in, in, in other countries that are um, further advanced in, through, the, through this crisis than we are, um, where, you know, there is a resumption of economic activity and, and one can, can see that, that uh, you know, the, the definitely activities well off, off, off the trough um, during the crisis. Um, what we can observe is the, be, the, the valuations and the price behavior of, of different assets. And 
earlier on, I showed the price to book graph of, of both global and South African equity, and we can observe our current valuation. So, you know, we, 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 we do think there will be some recovery, you know, going in at, at some rate. And um, when, as that occurs, we do see uh, a, a re-rating. Some of it's happened, but we see the opportunity for businesses to recover. And so it's about your starting valuation and, and, and what you will earn subsequently in terms of a return. Um, maybe Chris can, can expand yeah. a bit. Yeah, thanks, Michael. Um, yeah, so without wanting to sort of repeat the example of Standard Bank, but it, it talks very much to some of the points that Michael has already made, is what we're observing is valuations for a number of South African facing companies that are, you know, the lowest, you're getting an opportunity to buy them on multiples that we haven't seen in 40 years. Um, and it, we acknowledge that there are going to be consequences um, of a self-imposed lockdown. Um, it may well lead to uh, rising uh, job losses, et cetera, but um, it's not that we haven't experienced crises in the, in, in his, in, in, in the past. Um, but yeah, so we, it, it, it's an unknown as to when Standard Bank's earnings or dividends return to the level uh, that they generated last year, but that the quantum of the price fall in our, in our view, um, you know, it, at, at a point in time, Standard Bank had fallen more than 50% or lost 50% of its value this year. Um, if you simply lose one year's worth of dividend um, and, and then dividends resume and get back to last year's level, you know, all you've really foregone is, is, the, is a year's worth of yield. Um, and so it's, it's, the, it's the magnitude of the price fall. Um, and, and we believe that those share prices are discounting a lot more bad news than, than what the, the future holds. And, and that's, we, we're prepared to back the valuation. As I said earlier in the presentation, I, I actually, we don't know the future is uncertain and we don't know the, the path of the recovery. Thank you, Chris. Thank you. I think that brings us to the end of the, uh, this webinar. Um, thank you for, ladies and gentlemen, for joining us. Uh, we hope you found it of interest and of value. Um, as I said at the start, we will email out tomorrow a link to the recording. So if anybody wanted to look at um, some aspects of this again, feel free to do so. And on the website, you'll also find recordings of the previous uh, webinars in the series. So on that point, my thanks to Chris and to Michael, colleagues, for your time and your assistance in preparing. Uh, and have a good day and stay safe. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Thank you.